Hello, this is Carrie Fell. Welcome to my studio. Today I'm going to warp up for a V cowl. It will be a houndstooth pattern. Now houndstooth is a very interesting pattern. It is woven in plain weave and the pattern is created purely by color. So what happens is when you thread it, you thread too light, too dark, too light, too dark, all the way across. When you weave it, you weave too light, too dark, too light, too dark, and the houndstooth pattern automatically appears. So today I'm going to warp up with these two colors. They are from my Nest subscription box. First off, I've clamped my loom to the table. I have an eight foot table that I'm going to use. And I put the clamp on there and because the clamp can easily slide out when I'm, um, you know, yanking, especially when I'm winding on, uh, I put a piece of painter's tape around there so the, the little metal thing won't slide back out through the hole. That's my solution for that. And then I put my two lovely colors. I've taken the skeins, wound them into balls already. And I put them on the floor here before I start warping. This is direct warping. I really dislike using the vertical format um, for videoing. Makes everything seem a little smaller, but um, it works best uh, for showing what I'm doing here because you can see the entire table while I do this. So I take the, my first color and I tie it onto the crossbar here leaving the yarn on the floor. And now I'm going to do all the blue before I move over to the caramel color. So I'm going to pull it through every second slot. I have a, a workman's clamp at the other end. Um, it's clamped firmly on with the with a construction or woodworking clamp. Uh, so I've threaded it to, through the first slot in my heddle and now I skip a slot and pull it through the next one. And I'm going to continue doing every second slot. until I've gone all the way across the pedal. This doesn't need to be pulled tight. The tension happens when it's wound on. And honestly, I think I must do this differently than most people comb and pull tight after every crank as you'll see so if you've got your method of warping don't change it to my way if it's working for you do as you know not as I say so I'm at the end So now I grab the second color off the floor, tie it on near the beginning, and then I pull it through the empty slots. So at this point, I will remove it from the peg at the end. it hits the bar here. I have a magazine that I use 
I've been using it since I first bought the loom three years ago. I've <laughs> been using the same magazine. Just the right stiffness to, to cover the knots. And uh, give me a smooth rolling on. So I comb with my fingers, pull everything so it's straight and wind on. And I have the placemats. My placemats from the dollar store is what I put on next. They're a little more flexible than the magazine. But now that the knots are covered, the placemats will do a good job. And this is why I make sure my loom is clamped nicely to the table and why I have that tape on there. It uh, stops me from pulling the loom off the clamp because this is where I put a fair amount of tension. So I hold on and I yank so that it's tight around that back door and then I wind on. And I even grab the placemat and yank downwards on it to make sure it's pulled onto the bar. Again, this is where I do my tensioning. Now this is where I'm going to tie it on to the front. Take these and I tie loose overhand loops like this. So this heddle, even if it falls out, it's not going anywhere. So here's now the front of the loom and all the threads coming through. At this point, uh, they're threaded through the slots only, but you can see they're alternated blue gold, blue gold, all the way across. So I'll be uh, undoing this and I'll cut the ends here and then I'll be moving one of these over into the adjacent hole all the way across and then I'll have uh, two ends of blue and two ends of gold all the way across. So right now I am just weaving a header and this is so that I have something to beat against when I start the actual uh, weaving of the, of the cowl. So that is six passes of a scrap yarn. I like to use a wool because it grips. It's not going to slide away. And I like to use the same weight uh, that I'll be weaving with so that I just I don't distort the the threads. So I've wound the two colors that I used in the warp. I've wound them onto shuttles because uh, they will also be my weft. I have my notes here, which I will type up for you and uh, probably put on my Patreon. I think I'll put notes on, on how to make a regular V cowl and then maybe add some notes on how to um, how to make the houndstooth pattern and maybe some other types as well. But um, I have to turn these chicken scratches into something readable. But they'll be on my uh, Patreon. So Okay. As with the um, other V-cowls that I've made, 
I will start from the right with a tail hanging down off the right and I will leave at least six or seven inches. Um, that will be incorporated into the fringe later. And the caramel colored is the light color and I will start with that and it is kind of important that um, I do start with that uh, whatever I've started with uh, warping with on the left here I need to use the opposite one here because this edge is going to come around and weave in and this is the edge that's going to butt up against this side so I've done two passes with the light and then uh, the houndstooth pattern is two shots of light and two shots of dark. And in order to keep my edges neat, I will be carrying it up the sides on two different sides. So my uh, caramel will always be on my right and my uh, blue will always be on my left. So two shots of this, it's over here. And now two shots of blue and this one I don't want any long fringe here so I'm just going to leave uh, a short bit on this side so a pass from left to right with the blue and then back again but before I pull it across. I'm going to take the tail that's sticking out here and pull it back in. So about 10 threads before I beat it down. And so just on this one part here at the beginning we're going to have a doubled up thread and that's just how you deal with them. All right. So now this one I'm going to say that it's personal preference as to whether you catch the other weft thread at the sides or not. This very first one, I used the blue to catch the caramel colored yarn, and that's what the edge looked like. Then on, I didn't. I just passed the shuttle without worrying um, about whether it caught or not. And same with here. And so what ends up having is, is you have a bigger, slightly bigger bloop of the thread. Well, you know what? It's consistent. And so that looks intentional. I'm going to make it intentional. And it's faster weaving if I don't have to worry about catching the other weft as I go around the corner. Just there and back. Switch shuttles there and back. So, uh, it has a consistent look on the edge doing it that way and that's what I'm going to do. Now before I started I actually took a picture of these two yarn colors 
and I converted it to black and white because the key to doing a good hound's tooth is to have a very obvious difference between the two yarns, not necessarily in color, but in value. So it's important to have a light and a dark. Uh, you can't always tell, like you just assume that this is lighter and this is darker. Um, that's just because your mind tells you, oh, this is, you know, orange and, and that sort of thing. This is deeper, but not necessarily. I took a picture and I converted it to black and white and they are very similar in value. If you look at it in gray tones, uh, the colors are not all that different. I decided to go ahead anyways and weave a hound's tooth. I want it to be a subtle hound's tooth and not an in-your-face hound's tooth. So uh, I think it'll still work. It's not going to be super obvious. I think once wet finishing happens, everything tightens up, then, then um, the pattern will be a little more obvious. But uh, so I'm going for the hound's tooth with color rather than value, which generally is not a good idea, but I'm pushing it. We'll see what happens. Also, when I'm weaving, I'm making sure I'm not beating too hard. One thing that uh, beginners may find is that they know they're supposed to beat the yarn in place, and so they beat it. But what you're actually doing is placing the yarn, not beating it. So I'm just placing it not so it's touching the previous row, but so that there's little squares um, made between the, the yarns. And I have another video on what that means. Um, I'll link to it in the, in the I card above here. So I'm placing the weft. I'm not beating it. And that will keep everything square. Um, beginners will often beat it and in doing so they condense the pattern so much that it looks like it just um, narrow lines and you don't see the warp. You want to see the warp equally with the weft. This is a balanced weave 50-50. Um, just as much warp needs to be seen as weft and that's what gives the hound's tooth pattern. So before I uh, move on, because I haven't hem stitched or anything and that this needs um, to come off and be woven some more later, I'm gonna secure this end the same way I did with the other V cowls that I do. I've got a piece of tape and I actually tape the part that I've woven I catch this uh, end piece in there too so it can't be yanked about and tugged on. So my tape is lined up with the edge of the weaving so that later I can remove this gray part but this woven part will stay tight and intact and won't come undone when I remove it. And I'm just going to do my first bit of advancement so everything's caught in. So now it's just a matter of the um, monotonous weaving. Two passes of the one color and two passes of the next color. Making sure that I am weaving a balanced weave. Here we are after a few inches of weaving, so I thought I'd show you the, the edges. They are consistent and so I'm happy with how that looks. And on the other side, 
The other thing I want to mention is uh, the stick shuttles that I'm using. I love a boat shuttle and generally I like to use boat shuttles, especially on my floor loom, as um, they just glide along and they're very quick to sort of toss through the shed back and forth and uh, it makes for a, a quicker weaving. Uh, with a rigid heddle loom, it's a slower weaving process to begin with. So a boat shuttle would not speed it up entirely. It'll glide through the shed better, but it will also glide off my lap. The way I prop my rigid heddle, um, I have it leaning up against the, the table there, and then I prop this end between my knees. It's a nice narrow uh, loom. Uh, because I, I put down my shuttles, um, I put down the one, you know, that I'm not using on either side and I use my, my lap for a, a little table. If it was a boat shuttle, they would, they're made to be very slippery and slidey and it would slide off my lap and I'd forever be getting a crash as it, um, headed for the floor and crash to the ground and yank, uh, my yarn, uh, so it's just easier to have a nice um, stick shuttle that uh, that's stickier and, and sticks on my on my lap. Some people have um, nice wide rigid heddle looms and maybe a stand to hold it on. And sometimes the stand has a nice little tray on either side for shuttles, in which case a boat shuttle would be great because you could just plunk it on your on the tray on either side and it won't go anywhere. The trays have a little ridge to hold it in place and so that would be great. But uh, with my setup I'm happy to use a slow uh, stick shuttle which is also slower to uh, load the shuttle, you know, to wind the yarn on. But I'm okay. My rigid huddle loom is my slow weaving. Now I know that I threaded this in my 10 dent heddle there we go. So there are 10 warp threads per inch. So when I weave, I also want there to be 10 warp threads per inch. So let's see if I've got that. And I'm going to start counting with the with the twos, uh, from the two to the one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I am getting about nine and a half. And since the yarn the warp is under tension when it releases it's actually going to go slightly uh, as this thread uh, bounces back again so it's going to be 10 when i take it off the loom i'm pretty well guaranteed this is a, a nice square bead there you can see it backlit there and you can see that we have generally square windows and that's just what you want the threads are pulled tight and so that makes them thinner as well and so when it comes off the loom and it uh, the tension is released they will the warp threads will plump up again so those holes will be filled um, just by releasing the tension and then by the wet finishing afterwards it'll turn into a beautiful cloth but in the meantime this balanced weave is creating the pattern that we're looking for uh, so I've come to the end of the weaving the Packing has dropped away off the back beam and uh, I can see the end here. So I'm getting 16 inches of unwoven warp here. And uh, yeah, that usually is enough to give me a twisted fringe. So we'll see when we get there. Now we have two warp or sorry, we have two weft colors. They have their home spots on two different sides. So the gold color always ends here and the blue color always ends here. Now for a V cowl, you want uh, the ends over here. This is what's going to be incorporated into the fringe. Uh, you don't want any loose ends over here. This is when the this part comes off and and weaves back into itself this is that uh, little v at the front and so you don't want any um, ends here 
I also don't want to weave this blue one across. It'll disrupt the pattern, which is uh, two and two. So we want the blue to end here. So I'm going to cut uh, this thread and weave it back in for an inch or two on itself right here. So then I did one more pass of the gold color, which uh, helps lock that blue in. Once uh, this end is snipped off and this is wet finished, you won't even notice um, that it's a little bit thicker there. So there was the final pass of the gold, and then we're going to cut that. I'll cut it about there, make sure I have at least six inches. And now I'm done this part of the weaving and I can put a piece of tape on there which will hold all the threads in place. So now I've taped the fell line in order to hold the final few rows in place so that they don't loosen up and slide off. And now I can uh, loosen the tension and unroll this from the front beam. This is explained in my video, Weaving a V-Cowl, all the important bits that not shown in the other videos or something like that. It's all the important bits. And uh, I have written instructions as well on my uh, Patreon, um, which you can join up. If you become a supporter of mine on Patreon, um, the written instructions on how to uh, weave a V-Cowl as well as the particulars for for the hound's tooth. Yeah. Just look for the tiers that have uh, the written instructions as well as uh, you know behind the scenes stuff. So I'm going to remove this from the front beam now. So this is all in my other video, and but I just want to re reiterate that the scarf should be over the cloth beam at the front and behind the dowel. So over the cloth, cloth beam, over the tie-on rod, but behind the dowel. And that way you won't weave your V cowl to the loom. Ask me how I know. So I give it a little bit of of uh, slack there um, because it's going to take up when I start to wind this on. It's as simple as that. And now I can take the beginning and start to weave it back into the cowl on this side. So the first thing I do is I remove uh, the beginning few rows. So I'm pulling those extra threads out. Now this 
is going to go on with no twist. This is not going to be a Mobius scarf. Of course, you can make Mobius scarves um, with the V-cowl. Uh, the way we set it up, though, with the darks and lights, you can't put a, really put a twist in it because you want the first two threads um, to be dark because the last two were light. Um, if you put a twist on it and try to use this edge, um, you'll have the first two threads um, be light, which will give us four, and that will disrupt the pattern. And now the beauty of Houndstooth is as I start to weave these yarn threads in, it's going to continue the Houndstooth pattern on its own. Oh, I had some weaving here too. So I take the two blue and then the two gold color and two blue and two gold color and it's just going to continue the houndstooth pattern without any extra effort on my part which is kind of cool. I'm going to advance this just slightly just to make sure that it's um, snugly pinched in there. And again, the details on how I weave this in are available on my Weaving of Ecowl All the Important Bits video. But I'll just do the first couple here. I left a lot of yarn at the beginning, probably more than I needed to. And I'm not gonna have very much left at this end, so. Yeah. So I'm going to continue with this, just taking the two next threads and weaving them through by hand. So now we're going to deal with these loose ends here. I have plenty of length here, uh, probably more than I needed, and so I could twist these fringes. but. I don't have the length down at this end. This is going to weave to about here and it's going to be tight. Let's see. Yeah, it's going to be very tight at the end. So I'm going to just knot these ends. So I do that before I've gotten too far. And I'm going to do them in groups of four. This first one is going to be five because I have the leftover tail from. So just an overhead knot, which I will then snug up against the weaving. I will. We want it to have enough give so that in the wet finishing, threads can move around a bit and settle into the place that they should be. So I keep it fairly loose there. This is uh, not pulled in tight or we're going to get some puckering here. So, And then back to the weaving. So I finished weaving all the ends in and tied knots. Uh, I left a bit too much at the beginning, so I have quite a lot of fringe here. I didn't leave very much um, <laughs> before I started weaving in the cross threads, so there's there's not much give here. So at the end, I was needing to use I was needing to use a pickup stick to get a clean shed. You can see how difficult it would be to try to pass the threads through there. So I would just slide the pickup stick in stand it up and that would give me a clean shed to then draw the yarn through.
like this. So now I'm at the end. I've tied all my knots on this side. While it's still under tension, I'm going to put a piece of tape there. Because that is going to hold my last few rows of weaving while I take it off the loom. And yes, you see me wearing my candy cane pajamas. It is a pandemic after all. Now that the edge is secured, I can just cut it off the loom. I loosened the tension a bit so that there wouldn't be much sproinging happening. So I can unroll this. It's looped over the dowel, but the dowel just slides out. And here's the V cowl. I'll secure this edge next and then so I'll knot it up. I'm going to give this a rough trim so it doesn't get tangled in the wet finishing. After wet finishing, we'll give it a nice neat trim at the, I don't know, the one and a half inch mark. So it'll be a short fringe. It looks like this seam line is going to close up nicely and be a very successful V cowl. So wet finishing is next. Here's the finished V cowl. I decided to do just the short fringe on this one so they're knotted because I ran out of uh, Warp, I knew it was going to be short, so rather than twist, I just went for the knotted look. And being a balanced houndstooth pattern, the seam line where the body connects with the crossover part is pretty much undistinguishable from the rest of the pattern progression. That line is impossible to see. So there's the V at the front when wearing it. Just place that first and then take this one behind and loop it over the head. A nice classic look. I think I'll do this same pattern in a few other colors. Maybe I'll dye my own yarn. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. You can also check out my website and my online store. If you'd like to help support this channel, please consider joining my Patreon. Thank you for watching.